Yang Am I all? Yes, much obliged. Yang Arif, please the honorable court. My name is Hafiza. Give my counsel for any appearing on behalf of the appellants Namiti Ahmad, Shemid Abdul Majid, and Aina Dawood. The respondents, Ibn Hafiza, Maharud Miti Dahlan, Ibn Auram bin Hanif, are represented by my late friends Farhan Bila Sabda and Al-Atira Osman in this court proceeding. This is the ending of the appeal against the decision of the learned judge of the court after a trial involving the case of a land dispute between the appellants and the respondents. The learned judge held that the appellants were entitled to the damages and also that it was held that the respondents were declared a new owners of the property. Before I proceed, is Yang Arif aware and familiar with the facts or which be reminded of the facts of the case? You do, much wished. Yang Arif, as far as the background facts are concerned, they can be simply stated. Parents registered owners of land in the Menglembu area of Kinabalu. Mr. Tung Chi Wen, a registered real negotiator, was hired by the agents to negotiate for the sale of the sale for the sale of the property to a potential buyer for 2.5 million ringgit Malaysia. The appellants gave Mr. Tony custody of the settled deed of the property for safekeeping. However, the respondent who suddenly discovered to be the registered owner of the land via the sale and purchase agreement signed on February, February 12, 2021. Appellants also found that their land was listed with the respondent's rubbish. The High Court found that the appellant signatures on the purchase agreement, the power of attorney, the memorandum of transfer, and PDS 15. At the same time, the appellant was already ill entering the sale and purchase agreement with Mr. Wang Chin for the acquisition of the state property for 3 million ringgit Malaysia, which was set to close on March 15, 2021. In consequence, they had lost the value of the prospective investment to sell the state property to Mr. Wong Chin Chai for 3 million in Malaysia as a result of the execution of the sale and purchase agreement with the respondents. At the foot of their pleaded case, the appellants claimed several properties. They requested to set aside and to erase the registration of the transfer from the first to the respondent was allowed by the High Court. However, the claim for the and the claim for information that the appellants are the co-owners missed. As the respondents were considered as bona fide purchases for value without notice, they were constituted by the High Court as the co-owners of the stated property. The settlement with the High Court decision, the appellants appeal to the Court of Appeal does disappear. The appellants would like to bring two grounds of contention to be addressed for the court. Firstly, the appellants should get Major five hundred thousand Malaysia for the loss of prospective investment as well as damage and the transfer to the land. And secondly, the respondents are not entitled to indisability of title of the land immediately upon the registration of the transfer. I will be submitting the first ground on the issues of damages, while my co-counsel will be submitting on the second ground on the issue of indisability of title. My co-counsel and I will be requiring ten minutes each of the court's time for submission and we will reserve three minutes for our rebuttal. Yang Arif, before we move on to the first issue of our submission, I confirm Arif received a copy of the appellant's photo. Yes, much obliged. With Yang Arif's permission, I will start submitting the first ground of appeal. Moving to the first ground of appeal regarding the issues of damages, the appellants submit that the appellants should get the damages of 500,000 ringgit Malaysia for the loss of prospective investment and damages and the trespass to the land. In order to prove that the appellants are entitled to the damages, there are two sub-issues to be submitted. The first sub-issue is the appellants were already in a valid contract with other party for a higher price during the execution of the fraudulent sale and purchase agreement by the respondents. And the second sub-issue is the respondents have committed trespass to the appellants' land by littering the land with their rubbish. 
For the first sub-issue, we submit that the appellants were already in a contract with other party during the execution of the sale and purchase agreement by the respondents which made them suffer the loss of a prospective investment. Yang Arif, during the respondents' execution of the sale and purchase agreement, the appellants were already having a contract with Mr. Wang Chin Chai as they already set a specific date which is 15 of March 2021 to complete the sale and purchase agreement of the land. It is pertinent to note that having a date being set indicates that the contract between the appellants and Mr. Wang Chin Chai was already exist. All the requirements of a contract related to land related to land have been satisfied and they were only waiting for the date to execute their sale and purchase agreement. The appellants proposed the sale of the property to Mr. Wong. That particular proposal that has been accepted by Mr. Wong became a contract as all the other elements of a contract were fulfilled. There are six elements of contract. The first element is proposal. The second element is acceptance. The third element is intention to create legal relation. The fourth element is consideration. The fifth element is capacity. And the sixth element is certainty. Pursuant to section 10, subsection 1 of the Contracts Act, these elements have to be fulfilled in order for the agreement to become a contract. In this case, the first element was established where there was a proposal by the appellants to sell the property to Mr. Wong. The second element also has been established where there was an acceptance of the proposal by Mr. Wong. The third element also has been established where there was an intention to create legal relation as they both agreed on a date to complete their sale and purchase agreement. The fourth element also has been established as there was a consideration by both parties. The appellants promised to sell the property to Mr. Wong while Mr. Wong promised to buy the land. These promises are considered as consideration in terms of sale contracts. The fifth element has also been established where there was a capacity by both parties to conduct the contract and with the agreement on a deed to execute the sale and purchase agreement by both parties, the sixth element also was established as there was a certainty of the performance of the contract. With that, Yang Arif, all elements established. The agreement between the appellants and Mr. Wong is a contract, which means it is enforceable by law. The contract between the appellants and Mr. Wong was actually meant for the acquisition of the property with the price of 3 million ringgit Malaysia, which is 500,000 ringgit Malaysia higher than the price agreed by the respondents in the fraudulent sale and purchase agreement. The appellants expected a prospective investment of 3 million ringgit Malaysia. However, they later found out that the respondents have become the owners of the land with the price of only 2.5 million ringgit Malaysia. We refer to the case of Ballet and McManogal. In the case, Lord Diplo explained that in assessing the measures which depend on his view as to what would have happened in the future if something had not happened in the past. The court must make an estimation as to what are the chances that a particular thing would have happened and reflect those chances, whether they are more or less an event in the amount of damages which it awards. Yang Arif, with the unlawful execution of sale and purchase agreement by the respondents, the appellants have lost an opportunity to perform a sale and purchase agreement with Mr. Wong, also lost the chance to sell the land at a higher price, and lost a prospective investment of three million ringgit Malaysia. The same application can be seen in the federal court case of Teko National and Plenitude Drive Malaysia Syndrome Berhad and another, where due to the breach of contract done by the defendant, the court awarded damages to the plaintiff for the loss of opportunity suffered by the plaintiff. Further, in the case of Asia Plywood Company Senior Berhad and Aeon Co Malaysia Berhad and another, the plaintiff and the first defendant entered into a sale and purchase agreement. The defendant, however, kept on extending the fulfillment on conditions period. Had the defendant withdrawn the private caveat, the plaintiff could have entered a sale and purchase agreement with other party for the price of around 5 million ringgit Malaysia. The court was satisfied that it was proven on a balance of probabilities that the plaintiff had suffered a particular damages or loss, a particular damage or loss as a result 
of the wrongful act of the defendant. The plaintiff claimed damages to compensate the loss and the court allowed damages of around 2.4 billion ringgit Malaysia to be awarded to the plaintiff. Although this is a high court case that cannot be legally binding, it is however persuasive to support the case of loss of chance and loss of expected profit. For these reasons, it is submitted that in this present case, the appellees are also entitled to the damages of 500,000 ringgit Malaysia as they were already in a contract with Mr. Wang Chin Chai for a higher price during the execution of fraudulent sale and purchase agreement by the respondents. Because of the fraud, the appellants suffer the loss of prospective investment. Therefore, the appellants are entitled to the damages. Is there any clarifications needed by Yang Arif? No? Much obliged. For the second sub-issue, we submit that the respondents have committed trespass to the appellant's land by littering the land with their rubbish. Yang Arif, as it has been found that the respondent's sale and purchase agreement is fraudulent because the appellant's signatures on the sale and purchase agreement, the power of attorney, the memorandum of transfer, and form PDS 15 were forged, thus this means that the respondents obtained the ownership of the property through fraud and forgery. Yang Arif, according to Section 10 Contracts Act 1950, all agreements are contracts if they are made by the free consent of parties competent to contract. Section 14 of the Contracts Act provides that consent is free when it is not caused by coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation and mistake. The sale and purchase agreement between the respondents and the forger of the power of attorney lacks free consent of the owner of the land, which made the contract is a void contract. Yang Arif, referring to the case of Lee Siok Ching and Eden Realty Senior Berhad, the plaintiff submitted that the purported statutory declarations, sale and purchase agreements, memorandum of transfer, police report on alleged loss of title and other documents which purport to hear the name and signature were signed by an imposter and not by the plaintiff which proved that the defendant obtained the transfer of title by forgery. Section 340 subsection 2 paragraph B of the National Land Code provides that a registered title is defeasible where registration was obtained by means of an insufficient or void instrument. It was held that the forgery done made the contract became void, thus the defendant's title in the case is defeasible. The same goes to this case, where the respondents should not obtain the title of the ownership of the land. The appellants are by right still the owners of the land. Considering the facts that the land, was, the land was littered by the respondents' rubbish, the respondents have therefore committed trespass to the land, as the land is not under the possession of the respondents but the appellants. Trespass to land is an intentional wrongful entry and interference with someone's rightful possession of land even though he does not know that he is trespassing and even though he genuinely believed that the land was his. There are three elements to be established to prove a tortious liability under trespass to land. Firstly, the defendant has committed an act of interference with the plaintiff's land. The act was voluntary and direct and the land was in possession of the plaintiff. In the Book of Law of Torts in Malaysia by Dr. Asagov, it is stated that even the slightest crossing of the boundary is considered an act of interference. Acts of interference can be in many ways and one of them is placing any object in one's land. In the cases of Gifford and Dan and Anchor View House Development Limited and Berkeley House Dockland, it was held in the both cases that they were trespassery acts by erecting a sign over the plaintiff's forecourt and placing any part of structures in the land. Meanwhile, in this case, the respondent's act of littering of the land with rubbish is constituted as an act of interference. The first element has been established. Next, in the case of Man and Solnia, the defendant in this case erected a fence in his own land and after a while, it began to lean over to the claimant's land. It was held that it was a nuisance rather than a trespass because the act of interference is not voluntarily done. However, in this present case, the act was indeed voluntary and direct as the rubbish belongs to the respondents. The littering act also has been done voluntarily by the respondents 
without others' force or suggestion, and then directly by the respondents without involving any third party. Thus, the second element has been established. Next, referring to the Supreme Court case of Government of Malaysia, of Malaysia and Akasa bin Ahad, where the government decided to widen the highway and build an interchange, and this has brought to the closure of the access road to the plaintiff's petrol station. The court held that it is not a trespass as the access road is not under the possession of the plaintiff. However, in this particular case, where the land is in the possession of the appellants, as the appellants did not complete the sale and purchase agreement with Mr. Wong yet, and the sale and purchase agreement of the land underwent by the respondents is not valid. The land is still under the possession of the appellants, therefore, the third element also has been established. As such, from the cited cases above, all the elements of trespass established. The respondents have has committed trespass to the appellant's land and are liable under the torture's liability. Therefore, we submit that the appellants are also entitled to a reasonable amount of dominal damages from the respondents for trespassing their land. Is there any further clarifications needed by the court? No? Much obliged. If I may know for the assistance to the court, that should include me. Thank you, Yang Ari. May it please the court, my name is Nofara Hanani Binti Norman and my metric number is 1202131 and I am the core counsel for Ms. Hafiza Rosli. I appear before the court today representing the appellants Alzinda Binti Aman and the others and I intend to deal with the second ground of appeal which the respondents are not entitled to immediate indivisibility of title of the land upon the registration of the transfer. First, it is submitted that the respondent shall not obtain immediate indivisibility of title. Indivisibility of title that defined in National Land Code NLC cannot be interpreted due to the NLC was not in line with Sabah Land Ordinance SLO. Under Section 88 of Sabah Land Ordinance, Council has learned that the appellant had obtained good title uh, as bona fide purchasers of the land of value without notice since the registration of transfer was met into, divesting the respondents of their title to ownership of the land. Section 88 of the SLO implores the intention to ensure justice and fairness to the appellants, and appellants insist to focus on Section 88 that emphasize the essential of registration being a precondition to have valid ownership of title to any land. My Lord, by virtue of above mentioned provision, herewith on the effect of registration, appellants were assisted by the Australian case of Rexwa versus Wall, 1971, following from the Torian system, when Barwick CJ, in delivering the judgment of the court, observed in sum, the Torian system is a system of registering title that the, re the, the registration itself vested in the proprietor, which resulted a registration that come by valid instrument that is effect, uh, effective according in the terms of registration. In further, Malaysian court recognized the concept of immediate indivisibility of title upon the registration that implied the true meaning of section 88 of the SLO and some spirit taken from Torrent system. Cited from the High Court case of Tan Sri William Cheng Hang, Jem and another versus Tan Sri Ngan Ching Wen and others, 2013, where the court held that first torrent's title upon alienation grants to the registered owner a title that is immediately as expressly provided in section 92 of NLC and section 88 of the SLO. My Lord, 
In, it was judicially reviewed and interpreted in the case of Borneo Housing Mortgage Finance Berhad versus Time Engineering Berhad 1996, which court held that the case of Sabah land in the its name by the Sabah State Authority pursuant to the SLO under the relevant case vests conclusively in the aid, the legal and beneficial ownership in the Sabah land, which is immediately indivisible against the whole world. Apart from that, the appellant's state being bona fide purchases of value without notice were offered protection, covered by the rules and good conscience of their title against adversarial claim, even though the instrument used to give effect to the transfer was forged. The Lordship Richard Malajun J observed in the case of Mui Yu Tan versus Wong Ma Kyun and others, number two, 2003, that no one derived good title, right, or interest from a forged instrument unless he is fully satisfied with the doctrine of bona fide purchases for value and without notice. Hence, it is contended that Appealants are the bona fide purchases for value without notice. The concept of indivisibility can be better understandable in section 340 clause 1 of NLC that sets out the general principle that the proprietor in whose favor registration has been affected will obtain an indivisibility of title to or interest in the land. By indivisibility, it means that the immunity from uh, attack by a diverse by a diverse claim to the land in respect of which he is registered upon the private council in the case of Fraser versus Walker, 1967. Hence, the respondent were, the respondents were counted that to not be receiving or entitled to immediate indivisibility of title due to the sale and purchase, and purchase agreement being forged. Second, it was further submitted that the appellants are entitled to the call owners of the land. In Tan Ying Hong's case, the appellant, Mr. Tan, was the registered owner of a piece of land that located in Kuantan. The first respondent has executed charges by the favor of the third respondent, United Malayan Banking Corp, the bank which the power of the which the, which the power of the act granted by Mr. Tan to his attorney. The objective of this charge was to secure loans for Chini Timber Industry Senyan Berhad the second respondent, that cost RM 300,000 of sum. The bank has issued a notice of demand to him and to the realization Mr. Tan was known. At time, the charges were not met in his awareness. Mr. Tan claimed that the signature of him was forged and the power granted to the attorney had not been done by him had not been done by him and such charges instrument be void later mr tan appealed to the federal court after the high court found that mr tan never granted his power to the attorney and the first respondent had no power to charge the land to the bank and the registration on the document was found fraud was found fraud and forgery. Instead, United Malayan Banking Corp has obtained the indefeasibility indefeasible indefeasible title of the land. Question that came before the federal court was whether section 340 of NLC confers upon the registered proprietor or any person that having registered interest in the land and immediate or deferred indivisibility. Hence, the mentioned question given 
a view from the Adorna properties that cast the or Adorna properties case that had been correctly decided. Section 340 clause 3 of NLC directed by the proviso of a loan and not to the earlier subsection. Although section 340 clause 3 clause A and B and clause B referred to the circumstances specified in section 340 clause 2, the proviso applied that it was restricted to the subsequent purchases of the land. Due to that state of condition, a donor, a party who finds itself in the same position likewise in Adorna properties could not rely on section 340 clause 3 to claim that his title is indefeasible and avoid its title or interest for being impeached. The charges executed in Tan Ying Hong were not in dispute because it was a void instrument. The bank had the interest in good faith and value was not an issue due to the charges arose was void and would not be able to rely on section 340 clause 3 then mr tan's appeal were allowed was allowed and those charges were set aside following from the cases above the elements are established in the Court of Appeal that appellants deserve to be constituted as the co-owner of the land since the respondent will help, not entitled for the immediate indivisibility of title. May it please the Court, my name is Farah Nabilah Binti Zamada and I am the Senior Counsel on behalf of the respondents, namely Encik Magat bin Hasbullah, Maharun binti Dahlan and Minarwan bin Hanifa. Appearing together with me today is my learned co-counsel, Nurul Atirah binti Uthman. Yang Arif, we wish to put forward two arguments. I will be dealing with the first issue and the second issue will be dealt by my co-counsel. We will also reserve five minutes for the rebuttal session. Yang Arif, there are two issues to be submitted before this honorable court. The first is, the respondents are not obligated to pay for damages of 500,000 ringgit to the appellants for loss of prospective investment. And the second issue is the respondents are the bona fide purchasers for value without notice and should obtain immediate indefeasibility of title upon registration of the transfer. Yang Arif, I will be submitting on the first issue and my co-counsel will be submitting on the second issue. Yang Arif, before I move on to my first submission, may I confirm that Yang Arif has already received the bundle of authorities? With Yang Arif's permission, I will now proceed with the first submission. Yang Arif, for the first issue, we submit that there is no privative of there is no privity of contract, which is the sale purchase agreement between the appellant and the respondent dated 12 February 2021 that gives rise to the appellant to has a right to pursue a claim against the respondent. Generally, privity of contract can only happen between parties to contract where the non-party to the contract cannot impose obligations or rights to the parties in contract and vice versa. Only parties to contracts can sue to enforce their rights or claims damages as such. The claim for damages can only be claimed if one of the contract to the parties breach the contract, causing loss to the innocent party. In the present case, the first SPA is entered between Mr. Tony and the respondents without the knowledge of the appellants, which means the appellants are not privy to the SPA dated 12 February 2021. This is evident based on the fact that the defendant later discovered that the respondents had become the registered owners under the SPA agreement executed on 12 February 2021. Yang Arif, for privity to be established, there are three principles of doctrine of privity based on the case of Dunlop, Pneumatic Tire, and Selfish and Co Limited through the judgment of Lord Discount. Firstly, the doctrine of privity requires that only a party to contract can sue. Second, 
the, de the doctrine of consideration requires a person with whom a contract not under seal is made only able to enforce if there is a consideration from the promisee to the promiser. Thirdly, the doctrine of agency requires that a principle not named in the contract, an undisclosed principle, can only be sued if the promiser was contracted as an agent. In the present case, the appellants are not party to the contract. Therefore, they cannot, they cannot enforce rights arising from contract, such as to sue the respondents and to claim damages. Then, there was no consideration moving from the respondent to the appellants, and instead, the consideration moved from the respondent to Mr. Tony, which is the said 2.5 million. And lastly, Mr. Tony is only a real estate negotiator and not a contracted agent nor is given the power of attorney by the appellant. If Mr. Tony was an agent that acts on behalf of the appellants, then the appellants would not contend that the power of attorney is forged. So, there was no contractual nexus between the appellants and the respondents, which also means there is no legal proximity, because the respondents have never dealt with the plaintiff, and both the plaintiff and the respondents had no knowledge had no knowledge of each other's existence. Yes, they never met each other prior to the commencement of the present action. The respondents only had direct, uh, the respondents only had dealt directly with Mr. Tani Lung Chiren at all material times. Hence, it is obvious there is no proximity between the appellants and the respondents to enable the appellants to sue and claim damages from the respondents on contractual basis. Yang Arif, in the case of Wakem Enterprise, Sandy Remberhat and Jong Chuk and others, what happened in this case was the plaintiff, a developer, had entered into a development agreement with the defendants who owned a piece of land situated in Kuching. Subsequently, the defendants entered a sell and purchase agreement to sell the land to Beckham. Then the plaintiff makes a direct claim against Beckham for a specific performance of the development agreement or in the alternative damages for breach of agreement. It was held that Beckham was not a party to the development agreement as it was an agreement between the plaintiff and the defendant. And the plaintiff is not party to the sale and purchase agreement as it was between Beckham and the defendant. The fact that Beckham had agreed with the first to the fifth defendants that they were bound by the terms of, the, uh, of the development agreement were a matter between two parties involved and could not confer contractual privity between the plaintiff and Beckham. So for the purchase agreement, the plaintiff was not a party to the purchase agreement and thus could not enforce it. In the, in the instant appeal, the purchase agreement was entered between Mr. Tony and the respondents. Thus, the appellant as a non-party cannot bring an action on contract which is to sue and claim damages from the respondents. There was no contractual nexus between the plaintiff and the respondent. Yang Arif, for prospective investment, it would mean potential investment. The widest popular meaning of investment is the laying out of money at risk for the purchase of some species of property such as patent, income, or dividend, or at least the expectation of the receipt of income from the investment. In the present case, the appellant had only intended for the land to be sold and not to be invested. We can see this fact where the appellant engaged Mr. Tony to arrange for the sale of the said property to any prospective purchaser for a price of 2.5 million. It was simply an arrangement for a sale and purchase agreement of the land to any of prospective purchaser and not to prospective investor. There was no laying out of money at risk, thus it was not, thus it was not an investment. Therefore, there could not be a loss of prospective investment. Following the fact that the sale purchase agreement dated 12 February 2021 does not bind the appellant, automatically there was no contract and naturally, it will be impossible to claim damages under breach of contract pursuant to Section 74, Subsection 1, and Subsection 2 of the Contracts Act, where it is provided that when a contract has been broken, the party who suffers by the breach is entitled to receive 
from the party who has broken the contract compensation for any loss or damage caused to him thereby which naturally arose in the usual course of things from the breach or which the parties knew when they made the contract to be likely to result from the breach of it. Such, com uh, such compensation is not given for any remote and indirect loss damage sustained by the reason of breach. So there was no binding contract between the appellants and the respondents, nor the appellants are privy to the contract that did to a February. Hence, it would be impossible to claim damages under the Contracts Act as the damages can only be claimed because of a breach between one of the contractual parties. Moreover, the one who caused the plaintiff's loss was due to the wrongful act of Mr. Tony, who sold the land to the respondents with a forged power of a Tony. Hence, it was, a, uh, it was an indirect loss, and such loss is not given compensation. In regards of tortious liability, on 12 February, the respondent had become the registered owners, which means they are the legitimate owner of the land, and it would not constitute trespassing even if the land is littered with rubbish. Coupled with the fact that the London High Court judge has declared that the respondent is the new co-owners of the land, which means they have control over the land. So even if the appellants want to claim damages for tortious liability regarding trespass to land, the respondents had already become the rightful owner of the state land, thus there would be no cause of action, which is trespassing. In the case of Delaney and T.P. Smith and Co., the plaintiff cannot sue the defendant who has possession in law of the land. In the instant case, the respondents have the dejure possession, thus the appellant cannot sue for trespassing. In conclusion, there are no contractual nexus between the appellants and the respondents as the appellants are non privy to the SPA dated 12 February 2021 and the respondents are also not liable for trespassing. Hence, the appellant cannot claim damages against the respondents founded on contract and tortious liability. As such, Young Arif, we submit that the appellants are not entitled to damages 500,000 ringgit. ringgit. If there is no further clarif uh, if there is no further clarification from the honourable court, I shall conclude my submission on the first issue. Thank you, Yang Arif, for your time and indulgence. Yang Arif, I will continue to submit our second point of submission that the respondents are the bona fide purchaser for venue without notice, and should obtain immediate indefeasibility of title upon registration of the transfer. Firstly, I would like to bring the court attention to the definition of bona fide purchasers according to the Torrent system. A bona fide purchaser for venue without notice is a good faith buyer who has paid a stated price for a property without knowledge of existing titles to the property. Yang Arif, we submit that the respondents are bona fide purchasers that properly record the transaction under the Memorandum of Transfer, dated uh, 50 March 2021, without committing fraudulently transferred. Yang Arif, according to the case of Adorna Properties in Diran Berhad and Bunsun Bunyani, where the appellant in this case was protected by a proviso contained in Section 3, Subsection 3 of the National Land Code 1965. According to the proviso, provided that nothing in this subsection shall affect any title or interest acquired by any purchaser in good faith and for valuable consideration or by any person or body claiming through or under such a purchaser. Subsection 3 has provided that the title is divisible under any of the circumstances under subsection 2, including registered proprietor whom the land was subsequently transferred under forged document is liable to be set aside. Young Arif, however, subsection 3 contains a proviso where there is a class or category of registered proprietors who are any purchasers in good faith and for valuable consideration or any person or body claiming through or under him are excluded from the application of subsection 3. They obtained immediate indefeasibility of title notwithstanding that they acquired through forged documents. 
this can be interpreted that um, this proviso is giving protection to any parties that enter into a transfer of land by uh, alleged for forgery, despite obtaining it through the right procedure and most importantly with good faith, and it applies to the respondents in this case. The respected federal court had decided that a bona fide purchaser who acquired the title of land upon registration with good faith without aware or knowing it was forged will gain immediate indefeasibility of title. Here, I purposely submit this case again to the court so that we could see that the previous federal court appreciated the fact that bona fide purchases are supposed to be granted immediate indefeasibility upon registration. Yeah, Arif, I am aware and early that this case has been overruled by Tan Ying Hong and Tan Sian San and others, where the federal court decided otherwise. However, I would like to bring the court's attention to where the Tan Ying Hong and Tan Sian Sian case and the current case are different in facts, where the results also should be different. Yang Arif, in the case of Tan Ying Hong and Tan Sian Sian, the first respondent who was purporting to act under a power of attorney had executed the charges in, in favour of the third respondent bank. The appellant only became aware of the charge when he received a notice of demand from the third respondent, which is the bank. The appellant claimed that he had not signed the power of attorney, that it was forged, and that the charge instruments executed in favour of the third respondents were void. Young Arif, in this case, the appellant clearly stated that he never gave the power of attorney uh, to the first respondent of his property, where uh, there will be a probability for the respondent to obtain a property through forgery. For civil cases, our respected court will consider looking at the balance of probabilities for, from both parties, where in the current case, the appellants have engaged Mr. Tony to find a suitable purchaser for the state land and further handed the custody of the title deed to him. Meaning that the appellants have already given consent, have already given consent uh, to Mr. Tony to enter the sale and purchase agreement with any purchaser. Here we stand on the probabilities where the appellants in this case have denied all the signed documents with the respondents just because the appellants got a higher offer of price from other party with three million on 50 March 2021, whereby the respondents already signed the sale and purchase agreement on 12 February 2021. Yeah, Arif, therefore the current case judgment should depart from Tan Ying Hong's case where the respondents in the current case are undoubtedly bona fide purchases without any intention nor act to gain the state land by forgery. Yang Arif since the current case occurred in Sabah. Therefore, I rely on Section 88 of the Sabah Land Ordinance, where in this case, the Sabah Lands Ordinance should be referred to and followed, whereby the National Land Code is just a mere reference. Section 88 of the Sabah Land Ordinance stated that no new title and no dealing with a claim to or interest in any land except land still held under native customary tenure with documentary title shall be valid until it has been it has been registered in accordance with the provisions of this part. Nyang Arif section 88 of Sabah Land Ordinance reflects the intention of Parliament to highlight the importance of registration as the precondition for the validity of any new title or claim to or interest in, in any land. Therefore, the respondents have had received an immediate indefeasibility registered title in the land by virtue of the registration. Then Arif, according to the case of Housing Mortgage, Finance Berhad and Time Engineering Berhad, when in this case, the uh, United Lands Development Engineering Berhad, uh, which is the, develop, the developer, applied to the, uh, the appellant, uh, which is the finance company, for a loan to finance its industrial development project on four pieces of land in Sabah. 
by a sale and purchase agreement entered between the respondent, which was the purchaser, and the developer. The purchaser agreed uh, to purchase from the developer an industrial building to build on one of the state lands. Later, the developer created a charge over the lands in favour of the finance company to secure the repayment of the loan. However, the purchaser had paid the full uh, purchase price thereby affecting the completion of the contract of sale on that day. The judge pronounced judgment in favour of the purchaser. Here, the court said that uh, Section 88 of the Sabahnan Ordinance does imply the basic tolerance concept that a uh, title to or interest in land vests and divest only on registration. Thus, the land ordinance provides for a modified tolerance system of land registration. It followed that the Peninsula Malaysia cases, with their emphasis on the indefeasibility of charges, registered title guaranteed by Section 340 of the National Land Code 1965, where of no direct relevance to the issues which arose uh, for decision in the present case. The correct approach to adopt in considering the priority dispute in this case was to apply general law priority rules, not forgetting Section 88 of the Sabahan Ordinance. Yang Arif, the statement made by the Federal Court in this case is to emphasize the Section 88 of the Sabahan Ordinance uh, constitutes the basic concept of the torrent system in which title to or interest in land vests and divest upon registration and this is suitable to be applied in the current case where the respondents are the valid owner of the land in Mangalambu, Kota Kinabalu upon the registration where the respondents have purchased the land as stated with the price uh, stated in the sale and purchase agreement and in the sequence of that the appellants are no longer the owner of the state property as their title has have been divested uh, upon the registration and because of that they are also not eligible as the co-owner of the, of the state property. Therefore, the respondent's validity as the owner of the state land is protected by Section 88 of the Sabah Land Ordinance. Young Arif, I further strengthened my argu argument on the immediate indefeasibility of title for the bona fide purchaser by citing a New Zealand case from the decision of the Privy Council in Fraser and Walker and others. Fraser, the appellant, and his wife were the registered proprietors of farm property. Mrs. Fraser professing to act on behalf of herself and her husband. Uh, Mrs. Fraser took a, mortgage, uh, took a mortgage to the solicitors acting for her where a clerk witnessed her genuine signature to the mortgage and also a signature purporting to be that of the appellant which uh, she had previously uh, inserted. The mortgage and the certificate of the title were forwarded to the solicitors for the second respondents who paid over the loan money and in due course attended to the regist registration of the mortgage. As no payment of principal and interest was made, uh, the second respondent exercised their power of sale and the property was sold to the first respondent, which is Mr. Walker. Uh, the second respondent as mortgages executed a memorandum of transfer to the first respondent, which was registered after the registration of the second respondent's mortgage. It was considered that both the first respondent and the second respondent act throughout uh, in good faith. Yang Arif, the court in the above case held that Mr. Walker was a bona fide purchaser for value without notice, whereas Mr. Walker was unaware of Mrs. Fraser's fraud at the time of purchase. This means that Mr. Walker had the indefeasibility of title. This position was consistent with Section 183 of the New Zealand Land Transfer Act, which stated that fraud uh, would not defeat a bona fide purchaser for valuable consideration. Thus, the court gave 
Mr. Walker immediate in the feasibility of title. I once again emphasize upon the call in the current case that the respondents allegedly obtained the state property through uh, forged documents. Um, however, they did not have intention nor have any knowledge about the forgery and entered into the contract in good faith. Therefore, our court should consider the, the status of bona fide purchases that already purchased the land with full price but got uh, denied their rights as the valid owners of the property. The private counsel in Fraser and Walker case has shown the court's intention to wholly protect the valid uh, owner upon registration from any denial or challenge made by any parties by giving them the immediate title. Therefore, I submit to the Honourable Court of the current case that the respondents or the bona fide purchases should be granted immediate indefensibility of title of the said land. Even the instruments are allegedly acquired by forgery because the respondents already gained the title of the said land upon a valid registration and paid the full price uh, for the land. Yang Arif, uh, in conclusion, the respondents have gone through all the processes to validly gain the title of the seed land through the power of Artney and the resp respondents were already the valid owners of the, the seed land upon registration under the Memorandum of Transfer dated 25th March 2001. Hence, the respondents' valid position as the land owners should not be denied nor be challenged by anyone and should be granted immediate indefensibility uh, as protection to any denial or challenge made by others towards the valid position of the land. Yang Arif, based on the foregoing reasons, the respondents, namely Megat bin Hasbullah, Maharun bin Tidahlan, and Minarwan bin Hanifah, respectfully request to the court to dismiss the appeal and declare that the respondents are not obligated to pay for more for damages of uh, 500,000 ringgit to the appellants for loss of prospective investment. The respondents are the bona fide purchases for value without notice and should obtain immediate indefensibility of title upon registration of the transfer and finally, the appellants are not the co-owner of the segment. May it be the court. Please have two parts of the debate. Young Arif, firstly, the respondents claim that the appellants do not have to sue as the appellants were not privy to the contract. However, Young Arif, before we can look further to whether the party is privy to the contract or not, we have to determine first whether it was a contract or not. Arif, how can we say that they were privy to the contract if there was not even any existence of a valid contract? As we know that the contract was as on one of forty, as it was a VAP initial contract. For the right, there was no VAP contract between the residents and the authority. As the property in the first contract is appellant's rightful property, appellants have all the rights to sue the respondent. For your arif, the respondents allege that the appellants cannot sue the respondents. For your arif, the respondents are actually the ones who do not have the right to sue the appellants. Quoting the maxim of equity, who into equity must come with claims. This doctrine requires the court to deny equitable relief to a party who has forfeited good faith with respect to the subject of the claim. Hence, it can be understood that the maximum a party should be proud of the court's assistance because of some honesty, misrepresentation, illegality, or unfairness. In the present case, the respondents are here as equity but sitting on the ground of forgery, a very awful kind of dishonesty. This is unacceptable, hence, we still submit that the appellants are entitled to the damages. Secondly, if the respondents have sought to rely on the case of Adonai properties in the number height, then Kunyan to argue the respondents obtain immediate indemnity of the title. However, if we would like to emphasize that this 
case was depending on the national court. And we know this present dispute case was in Sabah where the national land was not applicable. Rather, we use Sabah and Adrian ordinance in this case. In Arif, the decision in the other property and the case was held by the letter judges as incorrectly decided. To the federal court case of Tan Ying Hong and Tan Xian San and Alice, the judges has reviewed the decision in the Donna case, held that the judges incorrectly decided the case and overturned the decision in the case of Tan Ying Hong. Therefore, the appellants still submit that respondents are not entitled to be immediate in the facility of title upon the registration of the transfer. Hence, the light of our submission. We pray that the court find the favor of the appellant. If the court requires no further this I can clear the appellant's debate. My name is Shana Arif. And my metric number is 1202131. And I am the court counsel for Ms. Hafiza Rosli. I appear before the Young Arif, I have two quick points to make. Firstly, the appellants contended that the appellants were already in a contract with other party for a higher price during the execution of the fraudulent sale and purchase agreement with the respondents, which made the appellants suffer the loss of, prospect of prospective investment. However, Arif, we submit that that is not the case. As what is mentioned by the senior counsel of the, of the appellants in the argument, there are six elements of a contract. However, Arif, in the present case, the contract between the appellants and Mr. Wong Chin Chai lack consideration, which is one of the essentials of the contract formation. Yang Arif, I would like to highlight a few facts in the mood problems to rebut this issue. In paragraph 4 of the, of the mood problem, the appellants discovered that the respondents had become the registered owner under sale and purchase agreement executed on 12 February. And in paragraph 6, the appellants also alleged that they were admit entering into a sale and purchase agreement with, with one Mr. Wong Chin Chai for the purchase of the said property for the price of 3 million, which was scheduled for 15 March. So from these facts, it can be seen that there was no concluded contract yet between the appellants and Mr. Wong Chin Chai during the execution of the fraudulent sale and purchase agreement with the respondents. The appellants were admit in the middle of entering into a sale and purchase agreement with there is still a room for negotiations and final contract will be concluded on 15 March 2021. And in between 12 February and 15 March, the first sale and purchase agreement will already entered between Mr. Tony and the respondent, which means that the title of it are in the position of the respondents by then and not in the hands of the appellants. So in order for a contract to be valid, both parties to contract must provide something as consideration or else they will be void pursuant to section 26, uh, 26 of the Contract Act. In the present case, for the contract to come into existence, the consideration moving from the appellants to Mr. Wong Chin Chai would be the title of deed, but it was no longer in the possession uh, of the appellants. For Mr. Wong, the consideration would be the 3 million which was scheduled for execution on 15 March 2021. So unless and until both parties sign the sale and purchase agreement on 15 March, then only the contract would come into existence. But even if they sign the, uh, sign the agreement, the contract would lack consideration moving from the appellants to Mr. Wong Chin Chai as there are no title of deed to give to Mr. Wong and thus there were no legally binding contract between the appellants and Mr. Wong Chin Chai. Yang Arif, the counsel for the appellants also contended that the respondent are not entitled to immediate indefeasibility of title of the land upon the registration of transfer. However, we submit that the respondents are bona fide purchases that properly record the transaction under the, mem under the memorandum of transfer dated 25 March without com committing fraudulently transferring and uh, without committing fraud transferred where section 88 of the Sabah land ordinance applies the basic concept of the torrent system in which title or interest in land vests and divest upon registration. Here, 
The respondents are already the valid owner of the said land and should not be denied of their possession of the land. Malaysian court may consider the other Commonwealth countries laws where in the, in the current case we refer to the New Zealand case where the PV Council gives whole protection to a bona fide purchasers, considering that the bona fide purchaser gains title uh, upon a property in a good faith without intention to commit forgery and already purchased the stated price for the property. Therefore, it is going to be unjust for the appellants to claim possession over the said land that has been validly transferred under the respondent's name. Yang Arif, if there is no further clarification from the court, I shall conclude my rebuttals here. Thank you, Yang Arif. Real time and indulgence.